Number 10, train engine cleaner. Ever wanted to get inside a small hole in the engine of a train and shovel out the coal that was left in there? Ever wanted to go underneath a train where you can't fully stand up in the middle of the night and rake out a dusty ash pan, getting all kinds of ash and stuff in your mouth? Perfect! You can go join up with the railroad as a train engine cleaner. These guys would spend their days shoveling five to six tons of coal into the furnace of the steam trains, and then spend their nights climbing into said furnace, cleaning it out, and then going out in the middle of the freezing cold, wet night into a trench covered in water and oil and dust, and get right up under that sucker and pull out all the ashes and dust and crap that came out of the engine while it had been running all day. Now Number 9. Linker Boy or Linker Men Before the introduction of gas lights on the streets of London, the only gas lighting came in the form of small children who made you believe that you wouldn't be able to walk the streets without them tagging along with a torch to help guide your way. Then they'd expect a tip from you. Oh, rascals. They weren't so bad. They were generally pretty helpful in getting you from point A to point B while being able to see one foot in front of the other. And their charge was usually just one farthing, or the equivalent of a quarter. The linker boy, like a lot of the jobs on this list, was actually featured in a lot of art and literature from the time, and there were even some rather infamous ones, like Lawrence Casey, who was the personal linker boy for the courtesan Betty Careless. Oi, where you going mate? You forgot to like and subscribe to the channel. Oh, and while I've got your attention, why not take a little peek over at our Facebook, where you'll find behind the scenes content. Get on with it! All right, all right, bloody hell, bloody hell. Number eight, knock her up. No, not like that. God. Look. I despise my alarm clock. It wakes me out of my deeply deserved beauty sleep at 6 a.m. every weekday morning. Now take the alarm clock and assign that job to a real person. That person is a knocker up, a person employed to wake up workers at mills and factories on early shifts, going from house to house using a long pole to knock on bedroom windows. In other words, a person employed to become the epitome of all my hatred in this world. If you had this job, well, you're not alive anymore, but I hate you. The people at the time were somewhat friendlier than they are now, and I'm sure the knocker upper wasn't a horrible person, but I'm sure there had to be some grumpy gills who would put their hand on your chest for doing this to them. Number seven, a phrenologist. I think if this YouTube thing doesn't work out for me, I'm gonna go and make up a science. It worked for phrenologists. They claimed that a person's personality, character traits, and abilities could all be figured out by bumps and indents on a person's skull. Characteristics like secretiveness, amativeness, conjugality, and combativeness were apparently controlled by areas of the brain that they called organs of the brain. The idea was dismissed by the church, but it nonetheless gained traction through Europe and was really popular in the States. The idea that you could modify these organs through self-control and practice sounded really good to self-help gurus at the time, if only it was real. Number six, a dog whipper. Looking for someone who absolutely despises dogs and doesn't mind being despised by the rest of us otherwise known as a dog whipper. Back in the day, huntsmen would often hunt foxes and nail their tails to church doors, which would attract dogs of the streets. You'd also have churchgoers who would bring their dogs with them to church. These dogs were not allowed in though, so they'd all have to wait outside. You know how dogs are though. They didn't just sit there waiting patiently. I'm sure some good boys and girls did, but more often than not, they'd be playing and sometimes fighting, disrupting the church services. Enter the dog whipper, who was armed with tongs to grab a dog and remove it from the church grounds, and a whip that would be used on the loudest of the poor pooches. Number five. A rat catcher. I know this will make a few of you out there squirm in your seats. Rats in Victorian England were a massive problem. They were everywhere. Every nook and cranny of your house, from the basement to the pipes. There was even an account of them spilling over from royal parks. So of course, where there is a problem, there is a job. Rat catchers were pretty famous throughout the Victorian era and were highly praised in society, but the job wasn't too glamorous. You'd be going into the dark, dirty places where rats would make their homes and catching and often killing thousands of rats a year. Often rat catchers would use other animals like dogs and ferrets to help them hunt down the rats too. I don't know though, it's gonna be me. Number four, an upright worker. Upright workers, otherwise known as chimney sweeps, actually started off being children as young as the age of four. The smaller size of the little kiddos was perfect for fitting inside and climbing up and down chimneys. The little suckers would rub their elbows and knees up against the brick of the chimney so much that they would be scraped raw before callousing. Isn't that lovely? No, 
No, it's not. It's horrible. Some children were deliberately underfed to keep them small enough to do the job. Some of them would get permanent lung damage from the dust and smut and smoke from the chimney. Some kids even got stuck in the chimneys. Thank the Lord they eventually passed a law that would make it illegal for anyone under the age of 21 to be a chimney sweep. But even then, tis not a profession many would like to have. Number 3. Matchstick Makers The idea of a lighter wasn't really a big thing in the Victorian era. They definitely existed, as the first one was invented in 1823, but it was not exactly a portable thing. So matches were your match. The first match was invented in 1805, but it sucked. The first friction activated match came about in 1826, and they were made with white phosphorus, which is extremely toxic. But they didn't have machines to make these matches. No, it was actually mainly done by teenage girls. And in the worst of conditions too. Forget protective gear. Oh, you want to take your lunch break away from the highly toxic white phosphorus? Oh, no, no, no. That's right. These girls would have to eat their lunch at their workstations, meaning they would end up ingesting the white phosphorus. Mmm, yes, my favorite seasoning. Number two. Resurrectionists. Back in the day, medical schools who wished to study the human body only really had access to the bodies of criminals who had hit the end of the line. There actually weren't too many of these bodies around, which led to a good price for bodies that were in reasonably good condition, other than being deceased. This wasn't exactly the greatest idea, as now you've created an opportunity for people with no morals or empathy to go and dig up fresh graves, becoming Resurrectionists. A cool name for an absolutely god awful profession, if you could call it that. The problem was bad enough that people would actually guard the graves of their recently deceased loved ones. No one should have to do that. Number one, Night Soil Man. Alright, if you need me, I'll be depositing my night soil over in the toilet. Poop. Night soil is poop. And the Night Soil Man? Well, you see, before we had real sewer systems, the night soil you deposited at home would go into a lovely hole in the ground. As you can imagine, these would tend to fill up over time, and that's when you have your night soilman come in. Yes, his job was to clear out the poop deposits from houses and cart it away in the middle of the night so nobody in polite society would have to see it. But they were always in business, so that makes the job a little less crappy. At number 10, death photography. Has anyone out there looked at really old photos and had that eerie thought that everyone in that photo is dead now? I have. I know it sounds kind of weird, but it's just something that comes to mind sometimes. Back in the Victorian era though, they really had that thought because death photography became a trend at the time. Back then, people were dropping like flies. They dealt with a lot of illnesses like measles, scarlet fever, diphtheria, rubella, typhus, and cholera. Death was all around them, but with the rise of photography, this became a new way of keeping a memento of their loved one who passed away. Before this, they would keep locks of hair and other items from their loved ones, but once they got access to cameras, families started posing with their dead relatives. Literally. Families would often keep the bodies of their dead loved one in the house for days after their passing in order to have that mourning period, but soon they started staging photo shoots with the remains of their relatives, posing them and dressing them up to make it look like they're still alive. Family members would take pictures with the deceased to have one last family portrait before burying their loved one. It's kind of heartwarming in a way, but also really creepy. At number 9, Emigration. During the Victorian era, there was unfortunately a lot of orphan children living in the streets of London. It became a pretty big problem because of the sheer amount of young people without homes or families. It was estimated that around 30,000 children were living on the streets in London in 1869. Soon a program was put into place to try and solve this issue and people started rounding up these orphan kids and shipping them off elsewhere to work in some of the British colonies. Many of the kids who were shipped off ended up working as farmhands or as domestic servants. Though many children were shipped off to places like New Zealand and Australia, the majority of them went to Canada. About 80,000 of them actually. They were sent away with hopes that they would be able to live better lives, but unfortunately for many of those kids, they didn't end up having any better luck in compared to when they lived on the streets. This practice ended up becoming pretty controversial as you can imagine. At number 8, Mental Health. 
Back in the Victorian era, the study of the human brain and psyche was still relatively new, so no one really knew what was going on up in people's noggins. Mental asylums started to pop up, and people started getting diagnosed with mental problems, even if the diagnosis wasn't accurate. The three labels that a patient could fall under were the manic, the melancholic, and those with dementia. The symptoms for those big three labels often varied, and people were admitted to asylums for some pretty messed up reasons. There was a list of common causes for mental illness that people referred to back then, and it included things like, quote, laziness, novel reading, superstition, an immoral life, and intemperance, as well as the act of self-pleasuring. For women, they could also be sent to asylums for some pretty ridiculous reasons, like imaginary female trouble, hysteria, rumor of husband murder, and even fits of desertion of husband. I am so glad things have changed since then. At number 7, Grave Robber. When you think of jobs back in the Victorian era, you might think of things like chimney sweeps and lawyers. But another relatively popular, though questionable, profession was being a grave robber. Yes, people actually made a living off robbing graves. As people studied medicine, they needed cadavers to practice on, but there was a law saying that only the bodies of those who had been executed for a crime could be used as a cadaver. And since the laws changed to include less and less crimes having death penalties, soon people started running out of cadavers to practice on, and this gave way to the boom in the grave robbing industry. People can make a pretty penny for snatching bodies from cemeteries and selling them to medical professionals and students. Fresher bodies went for more money, and the grave robbers not only made money off the sale of the cadaver, but they also charged a fee, so they ended up with a little extra cash in their pockets. Eventually, the grave robbing business became such a big problem that cemeteries started installing watchtowers and guards to prevent people from getting away with the dead. At number 6, Beauty. I've talked about this before in some past videos, but the Victorian era was famous for its strange beauty practices, so I just had to include it on this list. You're probably familiar with the makeup from the Victorian era. Women often painted their faces white to look as pale as possible, but even though they believed it made them look beautiful, it also did a lot of harm to their health. The white face paint that women would use was lead based, and as we all by now, lead makes you dead. But this white lead paint isn't the only thing that harms people's skin. Women would also wash their faces with ammonia to make their skin look paler. At night, women would rub opium on their faces, and if they were really dedicated to their beauty regime, they would also ingest arsenic. They were literally poisoning themselves in the name of beauty. Women would also use mercury on their eyebrows and eyelashes, and would use lemon juice or belladonna in their eyes, which could cause blindness in some people. Once again, I'm glad things have changed. At number 5, no divorce. Nowadays, divorce is quite common. All you have to do is sign a paper and you're done. But back in the Victorian era, before the Matrimonial Causes Act of 1857 allowed divorce, people had to find different ways of getting rid of their spouses. After all, just because there was no divorce doesn't mean that everyone was happy in their marriages. It turns out that in order to solve their problems and get rid of their spouse, people would just sell their wives, either in public or in private sales. Most of the time, a man would take his wife to the town square and just sell her off to a new man. According According to some records, some women had the power to veto a sale, and sometimes it was for cash. Though I think the cheapest that a wife was ever sold for was a pint of beer. This wasn't necessarily bad for the woman, because if she was sold to someone else, things could sometimes work out and she could live a better life with a better spouse. And if she didn't, then she would just get sold again and get to try her luck with a new man. At number 4, food additives. These days, people are becoming more and more concerned with artificial additives in their food. All natural, organic, pesticide and hormone free food is becoming more and more popular, but back in the Victorian era, people were putting all kinds of additives in their noms, and a lot of it was really, really bad for you. Like, we're talking deadly. Chalk and alum were often added to bread dough to make it whiter, and sometimes pipe clay, plaster of Paris, or sawdust was added to the mix as well. Red lead was sometimes added to cheese, lead was added to cider, mustard, wine, sugars, and candies, copper sulfates were used in preserving fruits, jams, and wine, mercury was used in candies, and even ice cream was made using a water and chalk mixture. All of these unsafe ingredients are actually what prompted the food safety industry because no matter what's going on, you shouldn't be eating lead, chalk, and mercury. At number 3, corpse medicine. Now earlier I mentioned the whole grave robber industry and how that really took off during the Victorian era, but now let's talk about how they used corpses in their medicine. Back then, some people believed that consuming certain parts of the human body could cure their ailments. I know. 
gross, right? One of the more popular medicines back then was a mixture made with human skull and chocolate, and it was believed to cure apoplexy. Back in the Victorian era, medical texts were published describing what parts of the human body could be used to treat specific ailments. One text described mixing the skull of a young woman with treacle to treat epilepsy. Another text says that you could treat paralysis with a candle made of human fat. Apparently, executioners were linked to this type of medicine as they would, you know, execute someone and then use the remains to become a doctor and treat people's illnesses. Imagine Grey's Anatomy, but with Victorian medicine. Sounds like an interesting thing to watch, but also probably not to experience. At number two, mummies. Speaking of dead people though, people from the Victorian era were oddly fascinated with mummies. I mean, I can understand the fascination to a certain extent because they're old and cool, but of course, these people just had to be extra weird and take that obsession with mummies to heights that they didn't need to be. People used ground up mummies to make paint, Pieces of mummies were sold in jars, and they were even used in advertising. One candy shop put a mummy on display in the store, claiming that it was the daughter of a pharaoh who saved baby Moses. I mean, that's weird, right? I understand that this was all happening as archaeologists were starting to uncover lost treasures and secrets from Egypt, but I mean, a mummy in a candy shop? Seems a little much. Number 10, Queen Victoria's passing. Some say it ended the Victorian era, but it actually kind of extended a little while past that. She was the longest reigning queen at the time and a symbol of Great Britain's power. She also wasn't the nicest. Uh, she oversaw the conquering of India, which pretty bad. The special flower wars in China, which saw China give five of its major cities to the British Empire, <laughs> including Hong Kong, which kind of an awkward one there too. So yeah, her passing was sad for most, but for others, especially foreign nations, it was a reminder that their brutal overseers are still there and they're probably still going to rule for another like 70 years. Oof. Number nine, World War One. This is considered to be the end of the Victorian era, and it makes sense, especially the first half of the war. It was a mixture of old world versus new world. Horses and cavalry swords versus Germans in trenches with large rapid fire blam blams. In Great Britain and of course other European nations, they were foaming at the mouth to attack each other. However, culturally speaking, they were the same since Victoria had passed. Not much had changed. However, after her passing, and of course after the war, big changes, huge changes. So much so that it changed the world and in different ways in different countries. Like we need a whole list to go over that, but empires fell, America got rich, and they went back fighting shortly 20 years later. It was kind of awkward. Number eight, stiff photographs. For some strange reason, people in the Victoria era were like the grandfathers of all goth kids. Any obsession people have today with the strange and unnatural, well, you can partially thank the Victorians. A good example of their obsession with the weird and oddities is post-mortem photographs. Yikes, yes. Given that photographs were a new and amazing technology, and for the time, yeah, they were, and that people had some less than living relatives lying about, well, it only made sense to capture their memory forever by having their picture taken. Dressed up, prepared, and positioned in many different ways just to bring the mantle by the fireplace together as what would a home be without the post-mortem photographs of your old Aunt Burge? Am I right or am I right? It's weird, I don't know. Number seven, grave robbing. If ladies of the evening and cold-blooded de-lifing have always been a part of life, then so it was grave robbing. The second someone was buried with anything valuable, there's been a creepier person on standby with a shovel. That's just how it goes. Poor Dompe from Zelda. Guy gets a bad rap. This was no different in Victorian times. However, while digging up corpses for baubles and trinkets was certainly done, there was a far more lucrative business, especially for those in the mad scientist business. <laughs> Sorry. People were paid under the coroner's table to dig up cadavers and retrieve them for doctors and medical professionals to conduct all sorts of freaky deaky stuff. Mostly just to learn, but you can be sure someone got a little weird with it. We always do, we always take it too far. Number six, Christmas fire. One of the things my mama always taught me was fire safety. My dad taught me how to deal with a bonfire after 10 beer, but well, mom's lesson was safer. Never leave the stove unattended. Put candles out when you're done and know your fire escape plan. You gotta know it, you never know. While this event may seem like a wholesome family fun on the holidays, I get anxiety just thinking about it. In Victorian times, families would play a game at Christmas called Snapdragon. 
You get a large dish or bowl or cauldron, I guess, large enough for everyone to gather around the table and fill it with a whole bottle of brandy. Then pour in some dates and large raisins. Then ignite said brandy ablaze and try to grab the blue flaming dates without getting burned. Folks, this is a time before modern firefighting techniques, burn medicine, and houses are just really close together. So one good fire could take down a whole block, maybe a city. Not a good idea. Don't do this. Don't recommend. Look, Mom, I got the flaming raisin. Now the curtains are on fire. Wow. Number five, the potato famine. Potatoes have been a staple of many cultures' cuisines for centuries, partially because of their ruggedness, easy to grow attitude, and not only filling, but very delicious. Ooh, let me some fries. Good box of hot fries and some salt, baby. Let's go. Well, 1845 Ireland was a wee bit different as a fungus outbreak was taking hold of the mighty potato harvest all over the country, thus creating a large famine that would see one million people or more perish in a large famine. Queen Victoria tried to help, but was extremely ineffective. And by help, well, I mean the same effort I put into reading books assigned to me in high school. Sorry, Miss Middleton, I used Cliff Notes. I'm sorry, I did. I used, I'm sorry, I love you, Miss Middleton, you're the best. But I read like 10 pages out of the book, so that's gotta count for something, right? Right? Number four, the Napoleonic Wars. Like World War I, this time can be stretched to include Victorian England. Why is this event so dark? Well, because Napoleon wasn't going to stop. France had recently discovered what freedom was, and sacre bleu, it tastes amazing. <laughs> and they overthrew their government. Napoleon surprised everyone by being an amazing general. Dude took on multiple nations at once and won multiple times. It's extremely impressive. However, in a classic case of went to his head, he became the leader of France and declared himself the first consul of France, or emperor in other terms, and started stripping away rights, especially from women, which sucks, like a construction worker who kicks off his boots at 5 p.m. I know you're out there, you guys just, you just kick them off. Just get rid of them, those boots, they're stinking. He invaded other European nations and was on a path to destruction until the international community put, him to, put, put a stop to it. They said no more, dude. Number three, dirty. It's dirty, in it? Oh, it's dirty. It should be noted that the streets of Victorian London were not clean at all. Maybe the filthiest, maybe the filthiest ever. It was so bad that in 1858, the Great Stink occurred, which basically was all the refuse and filth piling up in the River Thames. Combined with a heat wave in the summer, the issue had literally been mounting for years and now would come to an offensive bubbling over. Oh, that must be awful. The smell was so bad it was making people sick and people were most likely getting sick from the river from cholera outbreaks. God, that's disgusting. Cholera was more common than you'd like to think. It took some serious engineering and a lot of pumps to fix the sewage issue that was severely outdated. It wasn't fully fixed until 1875. Keep your soap and your hand sanitizing here, my folks. It's gonna be a little greasy. Number two, ladies of the evening. Oh yes, the streets of Victorian England were filthy, all right. And if every street corner was a lovely lass for lowering her dress in hopes of luring in a customer, as they say, oh yes, she shan't have to wait long, as this type of business was more common and profitable back then than you'd really like to think. Personally, I don't see why it is illegal or still is, especially if it becomes regulated. I mean, why not? Let, let them do what you gotta do. However, it was bad. There was a lot of sickness and bedroom-related sicknesses. It wasn't good, it was horrible. I just fell off the box. Sorry, I'm an idiot. Number one, Jack the Ripper. Oh, not much I can say about this guy that YouTube won't let me say, so here we go. The first serial unaliver to do what they do in the pale moonlight. The streets of Victorian London were crowded, dirty, like I said, and oftentimes chaotic. So for a true psychopath like Jack to exist only makes sense. He was kind of a ghost. He was responsible for the passing of several women who worked the streets and, uh, well, they were really violent crimes. We can't show you, but we'll show you a picture of Jack in a cloak or something, maybe in the moonlight or something like that. The worst part is he was never caught, like ever. Not, they, we, don't, we never got him. Or he was a she, or he was multiple people. We, we just don't know. There's many theories, but because of technology at the time and, and crime solving things, we just, we just didn't, we, we didn't get him. 10, it's just a cold sore. The Victorian era is cool. The art, the fashion, and technology of the time, I think, are always fun to take a look at, especially since steampunk has its roots in the Victorian era, and who doesn't like steampunk? Come on, there's just a lot of cool steampunk stuff. And honestly, we haven't seen a lot of that in a long time. We need, we need more, we need more. 
one. Something not so cool from that era, however, was what you could catch from another person should you decide to take up a bed with another person. Syphilis, yep, one heck of a disease. Funny enough, it was so common that it was making intimacy itself an unusual practice. People were scared, and honestly, maybe rightfully so. There's no cure, and if it progresses to its later stages back then, well, you'd go crazy. And then you'd end up being that guy that's always screaming in the streets. Every city has one. You know what I'm talking about. Number nine, the French letter. The issues of intimacy and its repercussions were becoming quite clear in the Victorian era. Something had to be done, as spending any amount of time in the brothels could have you shucking barnacles off your lower deck in the morning, if you know what I mean. Introducing the revolutionary new invention, prophylactics. For those that are college age, you might find it disturbing that these party favors weren't made of rubber or disposable. Yeah, hear me out. They were made of sheep's guts and they had to be soaked first so they would become flexible. Because when you put these bad boys on, they had to be fastened on. It's not very good, not very attractive. Once the deed had been signed off on, the device was then washed and then hung up to dry like your dirty laundry. Once it was dry, it was placed in a small box for the next time. Because seeing your wife's ankles might make you feel a certain kind of way and now you just have it ready to go. And Number eight, the products of our sins. Having fun when the lights can be turned off is great. Who doesn't enjoy a little toe curling? Yeah? Except sometimes there's this crazy thing that can happen where after nine months, another human spawns in. Insane, right? I know. Well, back in the Victorian era, this phenomenon was happening, but only for married couples. As you have to be married, of course, or else a child would be born out of wedlock, which to people at the time was just the worst. Oh, I never. These stigmas were not favorable for women as some preferred to avoid that kind of press by abandoning or straight up just unaliving their children. Horrible, just, just horrible times. Just another one of those good old wholesome times in history where we were treating women with the utmost respect and decency. Very nice. We were actually not very nice. Number seven, diet. Bedroom misconduct was becoming a huge issue. Refer to number nine and 10. While women did get most of the blame because, well, you know, history, men did get some of the blame. The issue of intimacy for men could be described as barbaric primal sense. So how do we curb this? How do we stop men from acting on these caveman urges, ooga booga? Well, simple really. Men just have to stop eating certain foods, as it was thought at the time that food had a link to the misconduct, or rather, the overabundance of bedroom related issues, including mustard, pepper, rich gravy, beer, wine, cider, and tobacco. And if you weren't paying attention, that's basically the diet of every man in Victorian times. Not sure how a jar of finely prepped mustard would get you flustered, but okay, sure. The beer makes sense though, you know, have a few beers, and even the mop leaning over in the corner looks pretty lonely and Boy, that mop has lovely hair. Number six, job market. Ladies of the evening, women of the night. Women who make beds go bump in the night. They were everywhere in Victorian London, a lot. It's partially related to some of the points I previously mentioned. Now, I'm not here to say it's necessarily a bad thing. Personally, I don't think it is. As they say, it's the oldest profession in the book, with an estimated 80,000 women working in the night by the late 1890s. You'd have to be crazy to miss that. I mean, they, they were literally everywhere. With numbers like that, there's something for everyone and in varying price ranges, as they can be found in brothels or townhomes set up by the wealthy men for their mistresses, pretty much anywhere trouble likes to spawn. Even some artists took advantage of this by living with the gorgeous girls of the evening, as going behind closed doors with one was debatable, but becoming friends? Now that's a social transgression. That, oh, becoming friend. Oh, how dare you befriend the people of the night? Number five, Jolly Lad. When people think about certain magazines that depict lewd imagery, you probably only think of Playboy. The bunny imagery was good marketing, honestly, just, just smart. But what if I told you the Hefmeister wasn't the first to publish such a magazine or imagery? Back in the Victorian era, there was some saucy imagery being produced. The government had outlawed such indecency, but this only made the lewd picture industry move underground, where naturally it flourished, especially in major cities. And if you knew where to go and how to ask for one, you could purchase something from the hidden menu. Kind of like when you go to McDonald's. Yeah, there's a hidden menu there too. Google it and see for yourself. I'd repeat what my favorite one is, but 
I would be in trouble from the YouTube gods. And I've been trading on thin ice this whole video, so uh, number four, the first counterculture. The 1960s were a very important time for many different people. Black Americans were fighting for the rights, music went from holding hands to strawberry fields, if you know what I'm saying, and everything that your parents told you just, just kind of felt wrong. If you grew up then, you know what I mean. I know people like to make fun of hippies, but there was some good ideas there. Well, in 1890s England, they were sort of having the same thing happen. Obviously, not as strong as a push as it was in the 60s, but still. Basically, after all the oppression towards bedroom relations, people began to open up. Uh, not literally, just, just open up thinking-wise. That's really gross, don't repeat that. There's only one way we all got here. Unless you're a test tube baby, of course. In that case, thank you for watching CT133576-2. To some historians, this makes sense. When you push and push for things to happen or ban, eventually people will push back, especially if it's something like bedroom time. Everybody, everybody likes a little bit of bedroom time. Valentine's Day wasn't too long ago. Remember that? It was good. It was fun. It was good, good fun. Number two, Queen Victoria. It seems old blighty herself may have been a tad more promiscuous than you'd think a royal to be. Well, not with other men, but her husband who in her diary claims to be the love of her life, which honestly is kind of sweet and, and romantic, that's nice. One thing that I find interesting, however, is that while lewd images were outlawed, the queen may have commissioned a painting of herself that was quite risque for the time. To gift to her husband, of course. Like, hypocrisy much? I say lewd, but it was probably just in her loose-fitting clothes with maybe like an ankle show on or something. Still, unusual behavior for the queen. I'll remember that the next time, Bly. I'll remember that. Number one, Prince Albert. If you've ever stepped foot into a tattoo parlor, then you might know where I'm going with this. Prince Albert, the husband of Queen Victoria, had some controversy circulating his name. One, because he shares a name with another Prince Albert, who was speculated to be Jack the Ripper, but also because of a very unique piercing. Go ahead and take a guess where that piercing is. Yeah, I didn't think so. As a man, if your anatomy could be described by an internet comedian using moderately funny euphemisms, then the piercing would go through your German army helmet. That makes sense, right? The horror. The absolute horror. It's rumored that he had one of these piercings. Did he? Ah, I'm not sure. But if it means anything to you, Nicholas II had a tattoo, so it's not completely out of the realm of possibility. Number 10, mudlarks. Victorian London. Around the 1840s, it was a bit of a mess. You know, a lot of sore throats, that's for sure. Everybody was sick all the time, and the jobs that were available certainly did not help the cause. The jobs that were available had you catching rats and crawling into sewers. One of the worst jobs to have was that of a mudlark. As their name hints towards, a mudlark involved getting in deep in the muck that builds up alongside the Thames River. This one was reserved for younger folks, obviously, because it was like working in quicksand. If you were older, you would just get trapped. It was pretty sad. It was also exhausting, not to mention the chances of being washed away by the river were pretty high. All for the slim chance of finding a pocket watch, driftwood, rags, anything really worth your troubles. Number nine, chimney sweep. I remember when I was younger, I had to sweep the chimney in the house every now and then, whatever, and I personally, I loved it, you know? I thought I was the father of the house for a bit, getting in the chimney, getting all dirty and stuff, doing this, my hands on my, on my waist, I don't know, it's, that's, that's what a man was when I was younger. That little broom too, I love that little broom. I remember when I would do this, my grandmother, who is very English, she would be shook. She would watch the entire time. She would be taken back into time because this was a terrible job to have in Victorian London. I was, yeah, it was not the same at all. Chimney sweeps were famously young. I can't say anything else there in regards, but yeah, they were, we lads, to say the least. History is horrible. 1840 was a good year, all things considered, because the law was passed that then made it illegal for anyone under the age of 21 to climb in and then clean a chimney. Thank, thank God, I'm glad that stopped. I was 18 cleaning my chimney. I had no idea I could have used this great law. Been like, actually, mother, a lot of claws. Number eight, funeral mute. Funerals suck, man. I was a pallbearer like three times before the age of 21. My one arm is just strong as fuck now, that's it. I can lift anything just with one arm. I thought being a pallbearer had a lot of pressure, right? Victorian London, 
saw many, many funeral mutes. Oliver Twist, one of those lousy jobs in that tale was that of a funeral mute. Funeral mutes were required to dress in all black with a sash while carrying a long cloth covered stick and your job would essentially be to stand and mourn silently at the door of the recently deceased home. Yeah, guy dies of a plague and you're like standing there like holding your breath like great, this is the worst job ever. You would then lead the coffin to the graveyard. So a lot of responsibility. Yeah, don't trip or breathe. Number seven, toilet troubles. Now, the Victorian era was unsanitary, to say the least, but it was also dangerous in ways that you wouldn't expect, right? Go to the bathroom and may not come out. One of the greatest Victorian inventions was that of the bathroom, but it took a few tries to figure out the whole, you know, methane gas problem. We gotta really deal with that one first and foremost. Spontaneous combustion of the bathroom was weirdly common. This would, uh, this is how, every time you take a shit, you were worried that you might just Ooh, that was horrible, that's so scary. Flammable gases like methane and hydrogen sulfide, they would build up over time with human waste. Human, a, a, a lot of human waste. Built up in the sewers and then eventually would back up into your homes. Next thing you know, you're lighting a candle and your bathroom's gone. Just like that. Now we have poopery. You know what that is? You ever see a little spray? After you go, you just, you hide what you've done with one little spray at your friend's house. It's fascinating how far we've come. Number six, stairs. Yeah, believe it or not, stairs were a common danger in Victorian times. I'm somebody personally who falls up and down stairs a lot. I'm 6'2", I'm lanky as shit. I have like a Gumby body. I walk around like Woody. I'm always falling up and down stuff. It's horrible, especially in Canada. It's so slippery. I'm always, always slipping all the time. In Victorian times, I would have been doomed. Houses were thrown up comedically fast. There wasn't a Mike Holmes on Holmes to come in and check it out. There wasn't a building inspector that made things, you know, safe. Servant staircases, they were tiny. They were out of sight. They were built built into these narrow walls, often missing steps that they had to and cut corners just to, you know, be narrow and out of the way. That plus a tray of hot soup and a lot of clothing, yeah, it was next to impossible to move around without something happening. A lot of fatalities in staircases. Even today, around 12,000 people die each year falling downstairs. Hold on to that railing. I'm here to remind you to hold on to that railing. It's crazy. There's actually no stairs there. I just made that whole thing up. Hit that like button for magic. Number five. Burke and Hare. Medical schools were offering a handsome fee for deceased bodies to study. This was, this is an odd time. So an unhealthy amount of Victorians came up with this new solution. They thought they were brilliant. Yeah, they would rob graves. They would just go and rob the freshest graves they could find. They would wait in the bushes until the funeral's over and then they'd go and Disgusting. It got so out of hand that family members were actually guarding the graves of recently deceased overnight. That's how bad it got. That's disgusting. But nobody goes down in history like William Burke and William Hare. They were an unlikely duo, to say the least. They wouldn't wait until the body was done living. You know what I mean? They would actually kill people and rush the process, all for a pretty penny. 16 victims in total between 1827 and 1828. It took 16 victims for people to start catching on to this weird plan. The pair would lose victims into their house, fill them with alcohol, and then they would suffocate them. They had a sick system and they would suffocate them because the body needed to be in the best condition possible in order to receive a payout from the Edinburgh University Medical School. So they would, you know, try and keep it as clean as possible, which is horrible to say, but it makes sense. The Anatomy Act in 1832 put an end to this horrific plan. Number four, bird hats. Look, I don't have much to say about this next one here because, well, all right, yeah. I love a good hat. I've worn a few hats here throughout my time on Bumblebee, some baseball caps, some beanies here and there, sure. I've never worn a dead bird on my hat though, and I don't think that I will. That's for certain, I might just leave that out. Taxidermy was a hot topic back in Victorian London. Folks would rock the dead beaver or bowler hat, any animal they would just prop up there, and it was considered fashion at the time, believe it or not. It was a dangerous trend though, long-term. Conservationalists were saying that 67,000 species of birds were all at risk of extinction due to this crazy dead bird hat craze. Can you imagine just a stuffed seagull on my hat? I'm like, all right, number five, here we go. It's crazy. Also, that's like a lot of weight, you know what I mean? A lot of weight on your head, just kind of, oh, sorry, there's just a dead pigeon on my head, so my neck's kind of sore. What if the wings opened up and you kind of just like got some air? Maybe that's why they did it. Number three, holiday cards. Today, these Hallmark holiday cards, they go way too hard. And they also have a card for everyone and everything, you name it. Birthdays, weddings, stepdad's name day, you're like, what? That's so specific. Like, they have everything covered. But back in the 1800s, these holiday cards, they were brand new. Nobody knew what to write or say, so they would just end up sending these artistic 
sentimental scenes. It would be like a frog in a top hat riding a bike. No caption, just that. You'd be like, hey, Merry Christmas, I guess. It'd be like a carrot with a face. It'd be a haunting image, really, to receive from a loved one on Christmas, but it's the thought that counts, I guess. This holiday season, just give your parents a card with this on it and then see what they do. Don't even write anything. Just stare at them in the corner, all Victorian-like, and be like, Mother, father, Merry Fortnite Christmas. I don't know what they would say. Number two, lots of arsenic. We of course have to mention a big problem in the 1800s. Arsenic, everywhere, all at once, okay? Skin lotion, tons of cosmetics, it was a nightmare. Even if you didn't use any facial cream or anything, it was everywhere else. It was in wallpaper, it was in dresses, it was in toys, medicine. My gosh, it really was horrible, it's a nightmare. And it's because arsenic was cheap at the time. It was during the Industrial Revolution. It was being unearthed more and more and finally, come 1851, the Arsenic Act was passed, which fixed a lot of issues. Yeah, we regulated that one not soon enough, but we definitely got that one fast. And finally, number one, Jack the Ripper. Unidentified to this day, we've got to end on a horrific note. Everybody's just finding out now about Jeffrey Dahmer, it seems. He's a hot topic on Netflix. But what about Jack the Ripper? How did he get away with it this entire time? Why aren't we going to see a Netflix doc on him? Ever. Jack the Ripper was active in the East London neighborhoods, primarily targeting s workers in the area. Now, at the time, the murders of five women from August to November of 1888 were believed to have been connected somehow to Jack the Ripper, although some sources claim that he was active even until 1891. Again, we're never going to know at this point. Many believe Jack the Ripper had some anatomical knowledge due to the way that he left his victims. I can't really say anything else because it's disgusting, but yeah, he knew some things, disgustingly. And while there were some suspects, including a member of the British royal family, believe it or not, Jack the Ripper was still never identified.